Uh, hello, my name is Anjan Brouwer. I am a developer and have been for the last 20 years professionally. I started programming when I was six and then I got a Commodore 64. And those cassette tapes and floppies are nice, but very expensive. So I went to this library uh, on my bike, got some books with basic code, started typing, started fixing the books with pencils, <laughs> <laughs> because there were many typos in there as well. And uh, yeah, that's kind of how I started programming and always kept on doing it. Um, I do a completely different study because I thought, well, when, I, when I'm finished with uh, studying, it's going to be 2000, so the Millennium Bug will be solved and there will be no work for all those IT people. <laughs> Good idea. Anyway, <laughs> uh, 2021 I started working as a developer, first C++, then Python, PHP, all kinds of languages and never stopped coding. Uh, also been doing a lot of open source stuff with Batch Team, Qt Pass and some demo scene stuff which in my case is also open source. It's not mandatory in the demo scene but I kind of like doing it that way. Um, so, where are we here for? Continuous integration. And what is continuous integration? Well, according to Wikipedia, Grady Bosch said in 1991, continuous integration is the practice of merging all developers working copies into a shared mainline several times a day. Well, apparently he didn't say the several times a day, but we'll keep the quote. Um, what I think CI is, it is a way of reducing regression. So things that used to work and all of a sudden stopped working uh, by making sure changes don't accidentally break existing features and contracts. That was during a lunch conversation and something else, I really don't like the continuous integration term. I prefer continuous improvement because that's, that's what it's all about in my opinion. So why do we do it? Well, the first thing said merging it several times a day into a main line. Um, as soon as people start coding, start working, you get a separation of paths. And sometimes it's hard to integrate those together and you want to keep that as easy as possible. So small changes several times a day is better than one big like, huge master plan of, of change. Um, also, <coughs> use CI to prevent regression. So something that used to work, you try fixing something on the completely opposite side of the code and something there stops working. You want to at least detect that. And the other thing is proving that your code works because, well, it, it works on my machine is not an excuse you can use in actual work. <laughs> so how do you do it? Well, step one, you need a repository uh, without a single source of truth, truth, so your code repository, you can't have continuous improvement or integration, in my opinion. You need to have tests for your code, because having code, having code running, yeah, that's fun, but what is it doing? What is it running? Is it working the same on my machine or somewhere else? Uh, you also need automated builds. This is not always the case, but in most cases it is and automated testing. And one thing, in my opinion, that's really important, always create a test for a bug fix. Even more so, do it test driven. So first, you have your problem. Someone says, oh, if I press this button and then that button and then that button, it breaks. So you then write some test code that does the clickies, make sure that yes, it fails, then do your fix and see that it doesn't fail anymore. Hey, now you have um, in Dutch geborgd, um, so you have, I forgot the word, covered. yeah, something like that, covered uh, the case that it actually works. And so you have a proof of work. So what are some common CI platforms? Well, a list. Most of you know GitLab, GitHub, uh, Jenkins, Travis, all kinds of stuff. Um, and they have their own CIs. Travis, I wouldn't advise anymore. It's not available for open source. It used to be free for open source. So if you have the public repository of code with a 
OC approved license. You could use all their stuff for free, not anymore. So let's do some CI, something very basic. We make a folder, we go into that folder, we <coughs> add some markdown. So I like CI because it helps. Uh, put it in Git, first commit, upload it, push, and <coughs> um, whoa, am I missing something? Yeah. Um, oh yeah, then we need CI. So we go and put a GitHub workflow YAML file. It's very simple. It needs a name. It needs to know when to run, and it needs to have at least one job. In this case, linting, running on Ubuntu, going there, check out, and run Markdown lint. Pretty simple. The more realistic would be to just copy it from your um, from your stash of templates. But then what happens? Uh oh, linting failed. Because anyone know why it went wrong? It was a very simple bit of Markdown. Uh, linting, oh sorry, linting is like spell check. So um, if you have a language that has rules, you can check if you are abiding to those rules. So in the case of Markdown, there is a way to make, for example, the hashtag becomes a uh, header, uh, h1 in HTML. Um, well, new line is new line. For example, lists you do with stars, etc. So that you can check if you abide to the rules that are defined for the Markdown language. And that's what the Markdown linter does. Um, so anyone has it to guess what's wrong? Missing new line between the header. Correct. And the so, in the easiest way, we add a new line. <laughs> we, we do some local linting to see if it's actually correct. Then we commit and we push. And ta da! It works. Nice. So, now, whenever we do any changes to the markdown, it will always be tested. And we had that bit of YAML, setting up, building, then running the action, markdown lint, complete the job, everything automated. So what can you CI? Well, if you can build something, so compiling, um, um, packing, all kinds of ways to build things, in at least a computer way. Um, if you can run it, execute a script or whatever, if you can test it, write automated tests for it, then you can CI it. But also if you can lint it or analyze it. So what is that linting and analyzing? This same list oh, <laughs> is here. <laughs> so linting. Syntax and coding standards. So that is, um, in case of the markdown, after a header, you need a new line for readability. In a lot of languages, there are rules about tabs or spaces or um, do, do you end with a uh, semicolon or not? That kind of stuff. Um, analyzing, well, you can look at the code without even really interpreting it and do some static analysis of the code. This type that is uh, requested here, is that actually the type that I'm putting in where I'm calling it? Um, those kind of stuff can be done with a static analysis tool. Um, you can check for dependencies, availability, vulnerabilities, etc. And whether or not something compiles. You can check for code execution and basic functioning. In case of a C++ program or something, you can just run it see if it exits with a zero or with some other error code. And you can do some unit testing, feature testing, end-to-end -end testing. I'll get back to those. So, why would you not CI? It takes time. <laughs> it takes time and it puts out a lot of carbon. Because every time you commit and you push, a lot of VMs somewhere in the data center get spun up 
run code, compile code, and then just throw all the stuff away and only present you with a check or a cross or some comments about what went wrong. So, yeah, that is not really good for the environment. But on the other hand, it does save a lot of development hours and other stuff. So, is it that bad for the climate? I don't know. I don't think so, Anja, because most of the energy is used to maintain the basic infrastructure and actually using the equipment as just minimal extra energy use. So, you're pretty okay, don't worry too much. Okay. that's <laughs> <laughs> all. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So let's get to some real-world examples that I have been met with. Uh, Kitty Pass. Uh, does anybody here not know Kitty Pass? <laughs> Good. Does anybody here uh, have? Has everybody here heard of the Pass standard Unix password manager? Uh, it is a bunch of bash scripts. It uses tree to make a list of your folders. It uh, uses GPG uh, and Git as a backend for storing, GPG for encryption. You can also encrypt from multiple recipients. So if you want to share part of your password store, you can select a folder and see with whom do I want to share this? Who should be able to decrypt this? Qt Pass is a frontend. Um, years ago, I was working at a company called Total Internet something, I forgot the name. Um, <laughs> and the way they shared secrets about their projects was literally with a window share that everybody could mount to, even from the guest network, that had a whole folder structure with all the contracts and also a .passwords file. <laughs> it was a text file with plain text, all the credentials for staging, production, whatever. Well, yeah, that's not something we can have. So we as developers went over to pass because we're all using MacBooks. So it was easy to do, to run that stuff. It was just um, brew install pass and get your GPG set up. Everybody could work with it. And the developers were happy because it fit very well into their flow. With pass, you can literally just use tab completion. So you type pass space, part of the project name, tap, part of what you want, uh, website, tap, enter, and you get your credentials uh, after you unlock your GPG key or however you do that stuff. Um, managers, they are afraid of terminals. Even just doing that simple stuff, pass, space, some letters, tap, some letters, yeah, no, they, they, they refused. So I thought, well, what to do? Mm -hmm. um, I've been playing around with Qt uh, framework. That's an easy way to do graphical apps that work on Windows, Linux, Mac, and look like a native application. So on Windows, it looks like a Windows app. On macOS, it looks like a macOS app. And on Linux, it looks like whatever you're running there, KDE, GNOME, whatever. Um, <coughs> so I thought, OK. Well, we have tree, so a tree view for files. That's a standard component, drag in, hook up to a path. Um, what else do we need? Oh yeah, we need a text view. And if you click, it just decodes. So that was one evening of work. And I had a read-only interface for interfacing with paths for managers. Super easy. Um, extra plus point, the company we were uh, working at, um, we used Mac OS Mail and the Mac integrated DPG stuff. And all of a sudden, everybody who was mailing someone else in the company <coughs> was sending encrypted emails. They just didn't know <laughs> because it was all transparent. So that was a fun uh, upside. Um, well, since I like uh, open source, I put it in open somewhere. Um, and I did a small hackathon. We were starting with iHack, a never really existed hackerspace in Amsterdam. <laughs> and we, to, to make it some fun, uh, we did a hackathon. Um, who wants to do translations for this? Because the Qt framework does translations nicely. And um, <coughs> I said, so everybody who starts, who knows a new language that's not in there, I'll buy you dinner. Everybody who does a bunch of translations of stuff, I'll get you a beer. Well, that was fun. Got a lot of languages in. Anyway. Um, 
that needed some uh, continuous integration <coughs> because I don't run Windows. So how do I make the QtPass installer.exe? Um, I can spin up a, a virtual box with there, but that doesn't scale well. So with just a bit of YAML, I can just spin up a machine somewhere, make it create a installer.exe and upload it back to GitHub as an artifact of, for example, a tag. Well, that works. And we can also do some code quality metrics in an automated way. Um, I used to do that with Travis because GitHub Actions didn't exist back then. I was already on GitHub and Travis was the highest on the Google or DuckDuckGo or whatever I could find. <laughs> and it was free for open source, so yay. Um, unfortunately, not anymore. And Windows, AppVayer, nearly the same syntax, I could build a Windows installer and run install maker or whatever that stuff is. And I worked for quite some, a while. Um, recently I got some time, finally, uh, to play again and, uh, well, Travis was an issue, so I need to make some actions to build macOS and Win uh, Linux um, and Windows builds. Um, yeah, I don't have those currently, but I did find something other that was fun, it was Super Linter. It's like a linter with a cape. What is Super Linter? Well, it has a lot of languages that it automatically detects. It just goes through your uh, repository and says, oh, this ends with .j, uh, .yml. That's probably a YAML file. Let's YAML lint it. This is a MD file. Markdown. Nice. It has 42 different types in there. Um, Yes, that includes English. It does a lot of checks on English, not just spelling checks, uh, but also jargon checks. Um, in case of QtPass, it was complaining that I was using macOS with a small m, macOS with a capital M, and OS X in the same file. Yeah, that's not consistent. So that gave me a warning. So that was really fun. Um, it is used and supported by GitHub. It's actually on github.com slash github slash superlinter. Um, and it, it's under active development. It works really well. So we have that done. And I needed something else. Someone told me, you need a white paper. If you want to be taken seriously with a software project, you need a white paper. And I'm like, what the fuck is a white I've, I've seen white papers. People give it to me and just go like, that's a lot of bullshit. <laughs> I'm never going to read that. So I thought, what can I do? Well, I have very good code comments in there because QtPass took a lot of uh, love to write. And I'll explain in a bit later uh, how that also happened. Um, <coughs> so can't I just auto-generate that documentation? Well, you can with Doxygen, for example. You can create all these things. It has connection charts. It has explanations about all the different things, interlinks with, with anchors. It's awesome. So <coughs> after a bit of coding, it starts with the readme and the change log. It has an index. And with five lines of code, I could generate a 340 page white paper <laughs> that is automatically generated every time I make a new version. As soon as I take a new version, it uploads the auto-generated white paper to my website. That's nice. So I still need to have a Mac and Linux, uh, Windows build. I don't know why I wrote Linux, because that's the only thing I run myself. But <laughs> um, so I can auto-generate those again. Travis was doing it for me. They stopped being free, so I stopped using them. And yeah, I'm seriously looking for volunteers to help me out with that kind of stuff. Or at least enthuse me to do it, because every time I want to start, I'm like, I don't want to start a Windows VM and debug how I have to build this shit. <laughs> anyway, another project that I had a lot of fun with continuous integration with, you might know from the batch team, not this batch team, but the SHA, MCH, etc. batch team. Uh, we have Hatchery, it's an app store for uh, MicroPython apps that run on badges. And there, when I was building that, I found out that code coverage is a fun game. 
It's a really, really fun game. And not just that, it's an addicting game. It works the same as with those simple clicky click at uh, games on your phone. That just, you, you do very simple, follow simple instructions. You don't really have to think. You're just clicking away and you see the numbers improve. More stars. The bar gets more green. And it's the same with unit testing. <laughs> if you ch look at code coverage, like these lists, and then you think, oh, hmm, that's a bit low. So I could do some extra testing in the co uh, so add some extra tests to cover more code in the config files. And, ah, that's nice. So every time you have like 10 minutes to spare, or you're bored during a meeting, or whatever, you can, uh, I can up that number again, get it higher, make it more fun. And that works with the same uh, dopamine receptors in your brain as those clicky games. It really works. And I've tested this also with skeptical developers. Just like, okay, these graphs, and look at his graphs, and their graphs. <laughs> and we got some competition going of people getting more and more coverage. Something else that is really fun and can be automated is automated API documentation. With just a couple of doc blocks in your code, you can have auto-generated client pages that for all the API endpoints, in this case a batch basket list, so you have a basket that contains for a batch, basket, SHA, whatever, SHA 2017, it just lists and gives it JSON. It auto-generates this page, so everybody who is wondering how does this the API work can just play with the API without installing anything, just going to a URL, works like a charm. And that's all automated. So yeah, history, um, code coverage, awesome. Uh, it's like in the high 90s. Uh, we have OpenAPI, and then I thought, oh yeah, I found out about this superlinter. Let's try it. Or, no. <laughs> uh, history is written in PHP. PHP uses a lot of extensions if you want to do interesting stuff. Uh, the crypto we use in Hatchery is done with Libsodium, and that's an extra PHP extension you have to install on your server. The standard Docker image for Superlinter doesn't allow you to add extra modules, so that really doesn't work. Some other languages probably also not good, so yeah, I thought let's do something about it, well, when I find the time. <laughs> Um, and here I went wrong, went very wrong, hmm, interesting. <laughs> uh, let's see, yeah, um, batch team is not just the hatchery. Um, we also have a lot of firmware for different badges, for different models, and every time we add some stuff, it might break one of the other badges. So we do firmware builds for every model of badge that we support on every commit, or at least every push to a uh, pull request. Um, and then we can check, is this still working? Will this still run on a badge? We don't do very extensive tests like um, <coughs> uh, emulating some badge screens, that kind of stuff. But if you have something that's emulable, for example, FPGA code, lots of people say, ah oh, yeah, that's really hard to automate. No, no, <laughs> you run 90% of your development time with an FPGA. You are playing with an emulator. You are playing, you're synthesizing the code, running it in an emulator. Why not do that in your tests? Why not have tests on emulators? So that's one of the things on my wish list for batch team, to run batch emulators and do some low level or high level testing instead of low level testing. Some more real-world examples. As many people here know, I work for the last two years for the Ministry of Health, and I'm in the so-called Toetjes team. <laughs> <laughs> There's a reason for that. Um, the first application we made was called BRBA, because uh, nobody dared to put a document on a minister's desk that said, the application that is going to be re recording all the vaccinations is called Brani Banani. <laughs> so we called it BRBA, which stands for Beveiligde uh, Opslag. 
registratie van bijzondere assets. Dankjewel Niels dat je dat hebt verzonnen. Niemand heeft onthouden, want het is gewoon Brani Benani. Uh, toen kwamen er later... Oh, sorry, in English. Uh, later, we, we added uh, HKVI, ZKVI, uh, CKVP, all kinds of stupid backronyms that were mostly names of cats. But all those four-letter acronyms in Dutch, that's vier-letter afkortingen, that is VLA. <laughs> so our team started to be called the VLA team, or VLA team. And then later, the municipal health system, uh, GGD, they needed something for uh, people without a uh, Dutch social security number. For example, refugees coming here, getting vaccinated. They also have to have a way to authenticate themselves. So we call that the patient ID authentication provider. And then a very, very smart uh, bureaucrat said, yes, but PAP, that is not a VLA. I said, no, but it is a liquid dessert. <laughs> 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 so from then on, we were called the Twitches team. And yes, it was a backronym again. We went for pop and then thought, how can we integrate it? Um, <laughs> so anyway, uh, with everything in government, we have to serve all the people. And every solution, no solution ever serves all the people. So there are just lots of exemption routes. And my team has a lot of applications. So, yes. How does that relate to Antifla? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I would prefer to not have those exemption routes be necessary. I would prefer it if the mainline streams within government uh, that concern citizens don't need all those exemption routes. So I'm still Antifla. Good question. <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, yeah, Ministry of Health, VLA project, there are so many exemptions and in this case we really needed to work 24-7, all the stupid edge cases. So, this is my first time actually doing real end-to-end -end testing and chain testing. And um, for end-to-end uh, -end testing is just <coughs> the application and in case of a web application having a browser click through all the options well you don't want to do that every time there is a big change you want to automate that so we used a system for that and chain testing all the things together so if you make a change in application a that connects to application b why not just bring both up in the current versions and do all the tests on that um, and then API guarantees. So as long as when there are APIs, you need some JSON schemas if it's a JSON API. What the? No. It's not. What? Yeah, let's do it again. I hope you have another half an hour. <laughs> Almost there, almost there, almost, oh, oh. almost there. Oh yeah, uh, Bluetooth. Yes, yes, yes. Huh. Yes. So yeah, you want to make sure that your APIs are consistent because an API of an application is a contract with other people using it. So your APIs, you should always check. And how do you check if well, the JSON will probably contain different data. Well, there's something for that. It's called JSON schemas, which is very nice because it can be used for nearly anything that uses JSON. A JSON schema is a JSON file that explains what the other JSON files should look like. For example, uh, it should contain a name, a date of birth, and a uh, an age. I don't know why both. Um, <laughs> name should be a string of x length, uh, minimal, maximum, and that you can write in your JSON schema. It will always check. Date of birth should be a string of, uh, what is it? Um, 4 plus 2 plus 2 plus 2, well, 10 or so uh, length, because uh, a date of birth is not a date, at least not in the Netherlands. There are people without a month, there are people without a day, it's a mess. <laughs> um, so yeah, uh, please start using uh, JSON schemas, because 
it really, really good. And you really, really want that. Um, if you want any help with it, just get me on signal or anything. Um, so yeah, end-to-end uh, -end testing. We are using Roba framework, which uses Selenium, which many people might know about. Uh, Robot framework is really nice because it uses a combination of Cucumber language, which is a fun language. Um, it's man manager speak. It's literally go to page A, click on link B, uh, see if there's words. <laughs> it's really fun. But Robot framework is not just the Cucumber language, it also uses Python. So one of the testers we hired was like, yeah, I have done these end-to-end things and I can do everything except I just can't get beyond step two of logging in. That's the two-factor authentication. I said, yes, but you know what two-factor is? It's like a shared secret and an HMAC with time. So that's this one-liner in Python and he was, oh, oh, in that case, boom, pfft, it works. <laughs> and he had two-factor authentication and now does it for everything. Um, so it's on the one hand, you have managers that can write some of the tests, and on the other hand, developers can do whatever they want. So, to summarize, what to CI? If you can build it, run it, test it, lint it, and I put the wrong slide here, um, analyze it, then you should CI. So if you're an author, well, it's in a language, so why not do a spell check automated um, and, and or style check? If you're a graphician, there are usually also rules to making graphics. For example, how should this fit on a sticker or what are the borders? That kind of stuff. If you're a pen tester, it's mostly YAML, JSON, all that kind of stuff. If whatever language you use, go and do continuous integration. Ah. <laughs> Broken slide deck, yep. <laughs> you should, you should <laughs> yes, I should have linted them and I shouldn't have done it in uh, LibreOffice but in LaTeX. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because linting of the LibreOffice files is extremely terrible. It's a zip file with XMLs and it's, uh, it's a crime against humanity. <laughs> so, uh, any questions? Wait, wait, microphone coming. <laughs> Any plans? Any plans on using JetGPT in your auto documentation creation? JetGPT? Uh, oh, JetGPT. Uh, no, I, I am planning on using it in my uh, test automation. So um, I've been looking in, in, into ways to have that cucumber uh, stuff be s uh, spewed out. Like so, um, you just give ChatGPT uh, a, 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 a screenshot of a website and say, you make some tests for this. And it starts to kind of work. Um, sometimes I use it for documentation, but not automated. Uh, I want to be in control of whatever that's the, 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 the superficial intelligence of ChatGPT GPT is trying to feed me. Because yeah, ChatGPT is like a populist, um, <laughs> a populist politician. It's very, very convincingly telling complete and utter bullshit. <laughs> Yes, I know. I mean, also, uh, the, uh, the white paper was all already 340 pages. I don't think that GPT needs to add anything. No, 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 I agree. I completely agree. <laughs> and it's small font even, and with, with lots of graphics. <laughs> yeah, that could work. <laughs> Any other questions? No? Well, then I would like to thank you all for listening. <laughs>